Welcome to the Global Business Women's Pod, brought to you by the Greater Houston Women's Chamber of Commerce. I am Susan Dyson and proud to be the CEO, President, and Founder of the Chamber. Please join us for this empowering podcast every Thursday at 6 p.m. Welcome to On Health with Houston Methodist. I'm Zach Moore. I'm a photographer and editor here, and I'm also a longtime podcaster. I'm Katie McCallum. I'm a former researcher turned health writer, mostly writing for our blogs. I'm Todd Ackerman. I'm a former medical reporter, currently an editor at Houston Methodist. I'm Kim Rivera, Houston Weber, and I'm a copywriter here at Houston Methodist. So weight loss medications, they've been around for a while, actually, but there's been a new wave, a recent wave that seemed to be getting a lot of attention and a lot of potential success. When did you first hear about these, Katie? Um, I think it was probably about last summer. You know, you started hearing about the celebrities taking um, Ozempic and things like that and maybe misusing Ozempic in some ways. I think that's when I first started hearing about them. Um, and as far as mainstream media goes, but they're, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, quote unquote new in the sense that, you know, these drugs have been around for a long time, just not necessarily for weight loss Mm -hmm. specifically. Um, you know, Kim and I were talking about seeing commercials, um, for these medications because they started for type two diabetes. I watched a lot of TV during the pandemic. Like I think many people did. And it just felt like I was always seeing an ad for Ozempic and, It was a type two diabetes drug until, you know, I started hearing about celebrities and I kept getting seeing ads or not ads, but on social media be like, is this celebrity on Ozempic? And I'm like, are they? Do they have diabetes? (laughs) I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Like, why would they be? And then that's when you're like, oh, people are taking these for weight loss. And then, yeah, I mean, I think they they are now, you know, these type two diabetes drugs are there are versions for weight loss now. Um, yeah, the term that I've heard is appetite blockers. Hmm. And I, have you guys heard that term? Or suppressants. Suppressants. Yeah. I haven't, but for people I know who have, who have taken them, you know, they do not have much of an appetite. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and, so and that makes sense. I know a couple of people on them as well, and that's always described to me. Like, oh, it's like an appetite blocker. So because seeing these commercials, you see so many, you know, commercials, medication drug commercials, and they all kind of – People are there walking are around and there's sunlight and butterflies in a field and you never know exactly what they're about. <laughs> but but you're doing the research for this. I'm like, oh, Ozempic, that's what this was for. Yeah, I did a, you know, it's funny. When we started hearing about them last summer, I wrote a blog post about them, just answering kind of some common questions. And I, again, I didn't realize they were di- type 2 diabetes medications being repurposed for weight loss. And those are always like really interesting stories to me because it's cool. You know, when you find out that a drug has a benefit, that's not the benefit it started with. Um, so they kind of have a cool story, too, I would say. Like, the history of them is, is pretty neat as well. But they've certainly transformed the landscape. It seems like a lot of people are on them these days, a lot of excitement about them. Yeah, and it probably seems safer to work with a physician on your weight loss regimen versus, you know, I because when, when I think of weight loss medications, medications and air quotes, I guess, you know, I think about, I don't know, trucker pills that are basically just speed that are geared to say you're going to lose weight. So, yeah, I mean, I think those were kind of some of those early pills too back in the 80s where, you know, not safe and are not around anymore. But then there's these various supplement iterations that kind of try to do the same thing. And yeah, I mean, I agree. I think weight loss has become very overwhelming. Of course, there's diets, there's wellness hacks, there's supplements out there to try. Um, and so I think the medications, Todd, I agree. They really have changed the landscape. And that's what we're talking about today, right, Zach? Yes, we talked to Dr. Garth Davis. He's a weight loss surgeon and bariatric surgeon here at Houston Methodist. And he prescribes a lot of these weight loss medications to his patients. And we had a very informative conversation about it. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Davis. Happy to be here. And tell us a little bit about what do you do as a bariatric surgeon here? So I am a weight loss surgeon. I'm also board certified in medical weight management. I also specialize in nutrition. So I kind of attack obesity from all fronts. Mm. And I'm the director for uh, the Center for Weight Management, where we have a complete crew of people that attack obesity from multiple different venues. We have specialists in exercise Uh, physiology. We have specialists in dietary management, uh, registered dietitians and nurse practitioners. Um, And we have uh, behavioral therapy specialists so that we provide our patients with multiple ways of approaching the problems with obesity and weight management. 
medicines, medications. Before we kind of really get into it, how much of a game changer are these these drugs? These re- relatively new drugs when it comes to weight loss. These are new drugs. There's been many drugs for weight management over many years, um, and they have been ranged from effective to dangerous, huh. um, and some have come and gone. Some have stayed around. I mean, we we had medications before this. I think people are a little bit surprised that all of a sudden it's like, oh my god, we have a medication. We've <laughs> had medications. These ones do perform better than the ones that we had. Um, but I mean, look, it's a game changer in that you know so many people in this country are overweight. Um, so many people are actually in the obese category, and we really haven't had a good solution besides surgery for many, many years. Which uh, surgery works extremely well, but for some people they don't qualify for surgery. For some people they can't afford surgery, and for some people they don't want to get surgery. And so this is finally a really good option for them. And do you think that this new wave is really broken through because of the results, as opposed to ones from the past? Yeah, I I think that the results are definitely driving a lot of it. I mean, the results are, you know, the media will hype them up higher Mm -hmm. than what, you know, you actually experience uh, in a clinic setting. Uh, But the results are definitely better than what we were getting before. You also do bariatric surgery. What would you say is uh, compared to taking weight loss medication? Like, what's more effective? What's more popular? Like, what I mean, are your more effective is it's clearly the surgery. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we're happy with the so the best weight loss we've seen so far has been twenty two percent in the um, surmount trials looking at Monjoro. But you know, a sleeve gastrectomy is about twenty seven percent. A bypass is about thirty two percent. So it's a lot more, mm-hmm. uh, and. You know, the surgeries, uh, these are going to be long-term solutions mm-hmm. for the most part. There's people that gain back weight. But when you look at some of the long-term studies, it was a recent really good comparison of four randomized controlled trials utilizing surgery long-term. And these were in diabetics. Uh, and diabetics, by the way, tend to lose less with the medication. So with the Wolgovi, we know it's down to about 15% weight loss. Um, but they found that in long-term studies, we're talking over 10 years, uh, the weight loss surgery still had significant amount of weight loss, uh, more than what we would see with the medications, and that's 10 years later after these surgeries. Um, so the surgeries tend to be longer lasting, obviously, and more effective. The other thing with the surgeries is that, well, first of all, there's a new surgery uh, that we're doing called the single anastomosis duodenal switch. It's also called the SADI procedure, and that's getting just there was a study that just released 10 years out with 36% weight loss at 10 years. Well, now what does that entail? So it's a combination of a sleeve gastrectomy. So we're taking out part of the stomach to make the stomach smaller. Mm -hmm. And then we're bypassing a considerable amount of the intestine so that we're sending food to the lower part of the intestine faster so we get that GLP-1 effect. Okay. Um, And we don't absorb as many calories. And so it is an exceedingly successful surgery with an exceedingly low complication rate. So the SADI, you know, while medicines are evolving, so is surgery. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind because the surgeries are not nearly as dangerous as they used to be. And they're very effective there. Look, there's a surgery in order to get surgery. You have to have a body mass index above 40, Mm -hmm. um, or between 35 and 40 with a comorbid illness like diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension uh, or sleep apnea. And so a lot of people who have a BMI of 30 to 35 or 30 to 40, they don't even qualify for surgery. So these meds are great for them. Um, when you get a BMI above 40, the meds are not as effective. Okay. So uh, in these trials, and I get, there's been so many trials, I can't remember the exact cutoff. I think it was 35 to 45 BMI. So they're not really looking at a lot of the patients we have, which are like 50, 55. Uh, in my own anecdotal uh, use of these medications, they just don't work as well in very high BMIs. That's not with everybody. But I tend to find that people with a very high BMI tend to do better with the surgeries. Obviously, with a lower BMI where you don't qualify, the medicines become a great opportunity. There's certain patients that just don't qualify for surgery and the medications are good and you have cirrhosis, things like that. Um, and then there's some people that just don't want surgery and they want to try the meds. I would imagine some of the appeal, in addition to just not having surgery, which is, you know, is not the top of everybody's list to you know, right. have, um, so I understand it, you know, the bariatric surgery that there's a certain like list of foods and stuff you just never eat again, right? After that? Uh, well, it depends what kind of surgery, but mm-hmm. with a gastric bypass, you could get something called dumping syndrome, which is if you eat really sugary foods, 
Um, you could get in a lot of intestinal well, upset. Which you and, probably shouldn't uh, be eating anyway, right? Yeah, stuff we, well, that's true, right? It's stuff we shouldn't be eating anyway, and it might be part of the reason the surgery works well, mm-hmm. uh, because it keeps you, you know, it's a negative reinforcement to not eat cake. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's part of the surgery. But, the, you know, the surgery is a, a last-ditch effort, but it's a, a, a last resort, but it's a resort that works in people that are really suffering from our, our weight. We're talking about, you know, serious weight. At this point, not I need to, you know, lose a few pounds for my wedding or something mm-hmm. like that. And while the people who take the medication are encouraged to you know, eat healthy, it's not like a hard and fast, like etch in stone rule that you cannot eat X, Y, and Z or it's going to undermine your medicine, right? Like it is right. with the surgery. So that's yeah. one potential other appeal of taking the medicine. Yeah, possibly. I mean, with sleeve gastrectomy, you could still eat these. Other, you don't really get the dumping syndrome okay. as much. So they're not as restricted as much. Gotcha. Gotcha. And if you do what you always done, you get what you always got. So if you know you could take the medication, but if you're going to eat junk food, you're you're, you're not going to have long term success. There you go. It's it's not a silver bullet. Not okay. a silver bullet. No. Gotcha. Can we talk a little bit about the, the difference between uh, weight loss meds and supplements? Like, is there a fine line between these two? Or well, there's not there... a fine line. There's a very <laughs> in the, uh, there's a very thick line, and it's a very obvious difference. There's, <laughs> there's no real good weight loss supplements mm-hmm. out there. Uh, I mean, berberine might get you uh, one to two pounds weight loss. Okay. Uh, I think it was in some trials on berberine. I mean, it's a very small amount. Um, there used to be, you know, some a little bit better results with some of the ephedrine type medications uh, or supplements, but those created really bad side effects. And so they've been banned. Uh, but there aren't any really good supplements for weight loss out there that are really effective. Okay. What are some of your thoughts on, on, on weight loss being not just as simple as diet and exercise because a lot of people say you diet, you exercise, you'll take care of it. But a lot of people do need that extra. Yeah. Look, diet and exercise hasn't worked at all. Right. (laughs) I mean, we continue to get uh, more and more obese. And I I think you got to understand that there's a definite genetic component to this. Mm -hmm. We were created in times of feast or famine or, or evolved during times of feast and famine. So we evolved a system that was really trying to prevent us from starving. And so we have a big, gigantic stomach that has a large storage capacity. And it's there because when there was food around, when we were cavemen, we better eat it. And we better eat as much of it as we can because we might not see it again. Mm -hmm. We also have hormones in our body that drive us to eat. We have hormones like ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone that comes from the stomach. So the stomach is basically sending signals to your brain all the time saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. And it could fit a lot. We also have this very complex system where our fat cells secrete a hormone called leptin. When you're gaining fat, you're gaining leptin because the fat cells are secreting leptin. And the brain reads this as, okay, I have some stores on me to survive a fast. Mm. And these are ancient genes. So the body's still thinking this way, whether or not your mind is. And we go on a diet. And we start losing fat, but when we lose fat, the leptin level drops and the brain looks at leptin kind of like a temperature sensor. It says, oh my gosh, leptin's dropping. We're going into a fast. I need to correct it. So everybody goes on a diet. Everybody loses weight in the beginning. And you know, when someone offers you a piece of cake, you say, I don't want a piece of cake. I'm on a diet. Not today. Not today. (laughs) But six weeks later, you know, someone offers you a piece of cake and you're like, oh, my God, that cake looks good. Is that Betty Crocker? Right. Uh, and you end up eating the cake and then you feel terrible and you blame yourself and you think this is a willpower it's issue. A cycle, but, yeah. but the problem is that and it's not a willpower issue at all. Willpower, if you're going to define it, would come from thought. It would come from a conscious thought saying, I am going to overcome this. Mm-hmm. But hunger does not sit in the conscious thought part of the brain. Hunger sits in the very primitive uh, brainstem and it sits in the areas that control heart rate and control breathing. And so hunger is a, uh, very, very genetically encoded, uh, physiologically controlled mechanism, uh, of, you know, <laughs> of keeping you alive, of survival. Mm. And, uh, it's hard to overcome that programming. And then you take that programming, you put people in this ridiculous world where, you know, we're supersizing everything. Our mm. portion sizes are enormous. We eat more often and way more than we need. And the food we eat is uniquely unsatiating. I mean, it is is uniquely created to be easily absorbed and easily palatable. And that combination with our genetics leads to an obesity crisis. Yeah. And, 
you look at our portion sizes in this country, right? If, if you go over to Europe, you, you get a um, a large. It's like our, our small. <laughs> right. But they're growing too. So uh, theirs is going up too and so is their weight. So mm. uh, we'll, we tend to affect – you know, our Western type culture is, is starting to affect the whole world. Mm. Now, in addition to just the genetic part of it all, do you think there's a – like a behavioral or, or pattern part of it all. Like when you're a kid, like finish your plate, finish your food. We have this kind of like, um, yeah, to us over and over again. There's, there's so many different factors, right? Uh-huh. I mean, there is, um, uh, you know, they, they did a study showing that certain zip codes have higher weight than other mm. zip codes. Uh, and that may be because of what food's available there. It may be because of just customs, uh, and rituals in those different communities. There can be childhood trauma that leads people to overeat as a self-soothing type of mechanism. Uh, there could be issues such as epigenetics, which means the effects on your genes while you're in utero. Basically, what your mom was eating affects how your uh, fat cells mm. respond. Um, depression. Uh, uh, substance abuse, uh, uh, addictive. I mean, you know, they've done these studies where they put people on functional MRI machines so they could see how their brains light up. Mm-hmm. And if you look at, for instance, if you take a person who is normal weight, and this this is important because I feel like a lot of people who have normal weight just look at someone who's overweight and say, just do what I do. But they don't understand that if they, that they are wired differently. Mm-hmm. So it's not as simple as just eat what I eat or do what I do. So they took people – if you take a normal weight person and you show them something like a cheeseburger, their brain lights up but not – it doesn't light up. as like, oh my god, I need that. But you show it to someone who's overweight and their brain lights up in a physiological pattern that says, oh my god, I need to eat that right now. Mm-hmm. Likewise, they looked at dopamine receptors through the brain. You know, dopamine is kind of our pleasure – uh, right. chemical in our brain. Um, if you look at a normal person, they've got lots of dopamine receptors through their arcuate nucleus of their brain. If you look at a cocaine addict or an alcoholic, they're lacking a lot of those dopamine receptors. Uh, so that, you know, develops this theory that their attempts to get cocaine or alcohol or anything like that is to simply, simply stimulate these as much dopamine receptors as they can. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see a very similar look in someone who suffers with obesity. They're also lacking these dopamine receptors in part of the brain. Uh, and so they're looking for that stimulation from food. So you could be looking – uh, for physiological stimulation uh, from food and the dopamine receptors, you could be using food as uh, a tool to deal with depression, uh, to, to deal with anxiety. There's so many different reasons that we eat and what drives us to eat. I can definitely relate to some of that myself because if, if you told me, hey, you could never have another glass of alcohol, I'd be like, okay. But if you told me, you can't have a chocolate shake ever again, I'm like, whoa, hold on. We, right. So. And that's the hard part, right? So like for for an alcoholic, they can say – I'm never going to drink again. Hmm. But it, so you can't tell someone you're never going to eat again. Right. And, and so if they're going to eat, they're going to be tempted. Hmm. And uh, that temptation makes it really hard to lose weight. Weight loss pills, also called diet pills, are nothing new. But their history isn't just long, it's complicated. Safety has previously been an issue. The FDA stepped in to ban or withdraw several early iterations, some of which were seriously unsafe. As a result, the agency imposed guidance to ensure more rigorous testing and review of weight loss medications in the late 1990s. This reduced concerns over safety, but the effectiveness of these pills left much to be desired. Weight loss supplements have made the story even murkier, growing into a $2 billion industry as people have searched for alternative ways to lose weight. Plenty of products, from natural fat burners to water pills, are claimed to help, but their effectiveness and safety aren't regulated by the FDA. Add to that the ever-growing list of diets to try these days, from keto to Whole30 to juice cleanses, and the newer weight loss trends you hear about on social media, like lettuce water and even laxative misuse, It's no wonder that so many of us don't know where to start when it comes to weight loss. That's why it's best to let the experts help. If you're looking for help losing weight, talk to your doctor.
getting into the science of, of, of what we're talking about with, the, with these new weight loss medications, how exactly do they work? So the new ones um, are a category of medications that mimic a natural peptide that we secrete from our intestine called GLP-1. Mm -hmm. And so there, this started, <laughs> funny enough, so with gastric bypass patients, for instance, mm -hmm. when you get a gastric bypass, your blood sugar gets under control very, very quickly. And there were a lot of questions as to why that happens. And in the studies, they found that because with a gastric bypass, we reroute the intestines, we send food to the lower part of the intestine faster. There are cells in the lower part of the intestine called incretin cells. They sense food. And when they sense food, they secrete a peptide hormone called GLP-1. And GLP-1 slows stomach emptying. It goes to these parts of the brains I was talking about before that control hunger. And it says, look, we're full. And it also has effects on the um, pancreas and, and on the liver. And so we started to understand that, you know, in surgery, we're getting a GLP-1 effect, and that's part of the success of surgery. So people started saying, well, can we get this GLP-1 effect in humans through a medication? Turns out, for whatever reason, they were studying the bite of a Gila monster. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> So Gila monsters, I guess, uh, part of their bite causes pancreatitis. So they wanted to know what chemical was it that affects the pancreas. And they were able to isolate this, uh, uh, it was called xenotide, which is a GLP-1 analog. And that was started to be used for diabetes. And in fact, worked great for diabetes. But they also noticed that not only was it working great for diabetes, but people weren't as hungry. Yeah. And so they started studying this effect, and they came up with longer-acting GLP-1 agonists, and that's how we got to Ozempic, which is a once-a-week shot that was becoming very popular for diabetes, and uh, the uh, Nova Nordisk, which, uh, which created Ozempic, started a very large trial looking at GLP-1 agonists for uh, weight loss. It's called the STEP trials, and they have step one, two, three, and it's gone all the way up to seven looking at different aspects of the drug. Mm -hmm. And what they found was really exceptional weight loss, up to 19% weight loss, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> diet and exercise, you're lucky if you get 5%. I mean, you're successful if you get 5%. Now, now, we're now when you say 19%, you mean 90% uh, of, the, of your of weight the, off. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is a really significant weight loss. We consider 5% significant, so 90% is like really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, and they've had some long-term studies. Uh, a competing company, uh, Eli Lilly, uh, came out with tercepatide, which is a combination of the GLP-1 agonist with another hormone called GIP. And uh, they showed 22% weight loss at three years. It was a three-year study. Um, which is really pretty impressive weight loss. You know, the surgeries, the sleeve gastrectomy gets 27%, so it's pretty close now to the sleeve gastrectomy. Gastro bypass gets higher. Uh, and so uh, this was the first time that we saw a medication that was getting to be on par with, not quite on par with surgery, but close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard the term appetite blockers. Did you find that an apt term for this medication? Or? Um, yeah, it, it is an appetite blocker. The GLP-1 acts in the hypothalamus, uh, which is the area I was talking about before mm -hmm. that controls hunger in it. And when you talk to patients that get these medications, they're just not that hungry. And a lot of them are just, you know, again, they're someone who's suffering with obesity is very different than someone who's not. And they have this constant drive to eat, this constant uh, thought about food. It's like sits on their shoulder at all times. Mm -hmm. And they are so thankful when they get these shots because that constant drive to eat goes away. Now, you mentioned the 19% the weight loss, and that, that's the uh, the highest number of it all. That's the highest for um, Ozempic or Wagovi. Uh, okay. It goes down lower if you're if you're diabetic, and then it tends to go down to about 15% weight loss we okay. see with patients. And you said there were some long-term studies. Now, do, do we know how long that you didn't have to stay on it? Like, is this a permanent? Well, uh, if you look at when these studies finished, people started regaining weight almost immediately. Okay. In one of the trials... They gave people Wagovi, and then I think it was at 22 weeks. I can't remember correctly, but uh, I think it was 22 weeks. They gave one group a placebo. So they didn't know they were getting a placebo now, right? They're okay. still doing the shot. They were losing weight. They're on this constant weight loss. Half the people then start 
using a placebo and the other half continue on Wagovi. And you see the group getting placebo immediately start regaining weight mm. while the Wagovi group keeps losing weight, which goes to show you that this is really working. Yeah. Um, the placebo uh, starts getting weight. But the other thing it tells you is that, well, what are we going to do then? Because do we have to stay on these medications forever? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that has not been answered. Um, okay. There is a considerable uh, argument and discussion about this. Um, there's some people that look at it that say, look, you know, like for cholesterol, we stay on the medications forever. For blood pressure, we stay on the medications. Is this going to be a medication that we stay on? Uh, and it may have to be. Um, I like to look at it like I'm going to use this as a tool to get weight off, to teach people once they're uh, – it turns out that you can stimulate GLP-1 naturally, mm -hmm. but you got to eat a diet very different than the diet we eat. So the GLP-1 effect, this whole idea that we have these cells in part of our small intestine that secrete this hormone called GLP-1 uh, that has become such a miracle that all the drug makers are after, you could actually secrete it normally. It's called the ileal break. And the idea is when food gets to the distal intestine, these cells say, okay, we've gotten the food we don't need anymore. And they secrete GLP-1, and that slows the stomach, and you're not hungry anymore. So how do you stimulate it naturally? Well, there's multiple food substances that can do that, especially greens, like spinach, dark greens. These, uh, greens have something in them called thylakoids, and thylakoids are in the chloroplast in the green. Thylakoids actually block our ability to break down fat, so that fat goes further down into the intestine and then stimulates the cells that secrete GLP-1. So dark mm -hmm. green vegetables are really important. There's some other things like certain kind of berries can do it like barberries. Barberries have something in it called berberine uh, on TikTok. Everybody's talking about berberine as the, <laughs> as the um, cheap way of doing GLP-1s. Uh, th they help. They're not the same. They're not quite as good, obviously, as the medication. Right. But eating a healthy, high green diet will stimulate this GLP-1 over time. So a high fruit, vegetable, green diet will do that. No, that's, that's interesting that, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way, the way you're, you're seeing the, the best long-term use of this drug is to get some progress, right? So from, from, from a patient, they'll lose some weight, you know, they take this for a while. Then during that time, you know, kind of retrain them in a certain way. Of, I teach them how to eat so that they can get the same satiety uh -huh. that they're getting from the medication. But that hasn't been studied. Okay. What, what, is my technique going to be successful? I don't know. We're, <laughs> we're going to have to see over time. Right. Uh, my feeling is that diet and exercise has not worked mm. for many, many years. It just hasn't worked. There's all these people online who just do it my way, do it my way. Uh, and, and, you know, so many trainers and online pseudo experts. But what we do is a lot we, of those pseudo experts these days. Yeah, right? a lot of these pseudo experts. <laughs> and what pseudo experts don't do is they don't track their outcomes. Mm. They don't see how their patient is or patient or client or whatever is doing a year later or right. two years later. Um, and that's what we're interested in. And mm -hmm. so we need more long term results to see if you can lose the weight because remember when they're losing the weight they are losing their leptin levels and the glp1 is counteracting the drop in leptin in the brain but once you take that glp1 away you've got a body that's got a lower leptin than it used to have before mm -hmm. and is that going to make the brain make you regain weight and we don't know that the other thing and you, you probably hear this a lot in the media, is that there is a loss of muscle mass mm -hmm. with the GLP-1. It's not really that the GLP-1 is causing muscle mass loss. It's causing you to eat less. And when you eat less, you lose muscle. Right. But that does affect metabolism over time. So now we're making someone or, – we're dropping someone's metabolism over time, and then we're going to take away this medication. Now they got a slow metabolism and a rising hunger. That's a recipe for failure. Right. So do I think that stopping the medication is going to be successful long term? I actually don't. Okay. Not at this point. Yeah, and we're such early stages. You know, we, just, yeah. we just don't know. We just, we just don't, don't know. know. Yeah. But, uh, and you, and it, this is ultimately a, an, an elective drug, as I understand it, right, for the most part? Or? Well, aren't all drugs are elective? Well, I mean, you get high <laughs> cholesterol. It's elective whether or not you take it. Right. But, but I, I guess my point is, like, it's not something you want to tell someone, okay, you're going to be taking this the rest of your life. Not yet. Yeah. But it maybe we get to that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because uh, we know that obesity is a, you know, it, it short, foreshortens your lifespan. And we know that these medications, we're just starting to test them. But there's been, there was an interesting study recently, uh, I think it was the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at these GLP-1 analogs and heart disease. And it greatly reduced mm -hmm. uh, cardiac morbidity and mortality as well as improved uh, 
heart function in people that had CHF, uh, congestive heart failure. So these medications, and of course, these are diabetic medications. So they do a great job for diabetes. They We know they're doing a great job for the heart. They might even do a great job for cancer since obesity does a great uh, is a big risk factor for cancer. Mm -hmm. So we might find that these medications – do such an amazing job at so many different disease processes that, you know, we do start to recommend them long term. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense since there's such a correlation between, you know, obesity and, you know, heart attacks and stroke and other things like that. It makes a lot of sense that that, that this would help across the board like that. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, as far as how you get the drugs, Ozempic, for example, is it available now in pill form? Well, there is an Ozempic called Resbelsis that's available in pill form, but it's not very good for weight loss. Okay. That's more for diabetes, and you can only get it for diabetes, so okay. you can't get it. Uh, it's, it's not indicated for um, weight loss. So then injection then is the – The injection is is the typical way to go, and there's several different uh, medications out there. So there's many for diabetes. There's Trulicity. There's Bieta, Victoza. Um, so there's different um, trade names and variations of this GLP-1 analog. When it comes to weight loss specifically, they have rebranded Ozempic as Wagovi. So Ozempic and Wagovi are the exact same thing called semaglutide. Okay. And uh, if you are a diabetic, the insurance company will pay for it as Ozempic. For most insurance companies will pay for it as Ozempic. If you are don't have diabetes and just looking to use the medication for weight loss, then you have to have a insurance company that's prepared to pay for Wagovi for weight loss. And some do and some don't. Mm -hmm. You just have to go to your individual provider. Monjaro is the new one, uh, the new kid on the block, which is the GLP-1 mixed with another hormone called GIP. And uh, Monjoro has even better results than Wagovi, but right now it is not FDA approved for weight loss, even though they've got they've completed several trials called the Surmount trials, and uh, it's proven to be extremely effective. It is yet to be FDA approved. So for right now, to get Monjoro, you could only get it if you're diabetic, or if you're willing to pay a really large cash price. It will probably be FDA approved soon, and it'll be the same thing. Does your insurance company cover it? And, and, and that's what we'll have to see. And then the other option are these compound pharmacies that are trying to emulate uh, or um, replicate the chemical on their own. And uh, there are several companies, for instance, in Houston that do this. The, the problem with this, the FDA put out a uh, a warning to everybody not to use these because they're not supervised. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're getting. Um, I think there are some companies that do a very good job that are reputable companies and you can get the medication for a lot cheaper than if you paid cash. But it's true that you just don't know what you're getting. Okay. Now you mentioned the cost. You know, some of these medications can be up to you know, $1,200 a month uh, with little to no help from insurance, as you said. Uh, and they're not covered by Medicare. Like, do, do you expect private insurance and Medicare to eventually cover these? I think Medicare will eventually cover for weight loss. Uh, I think they're going to do a cost-benefit. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, right now in Congress, they're cutting Medicare as we speak, mm -hmm. so uh, maybe they won't. I, I think if you were to do a cost-benefit analysis and you were to actually – carry this out a while so that you looked at the cardiac offense and the uh, uh, diabetes risk reduction and all that stuff, you might come to the conclusion that this is cost effective long term. Uh, but Medicare is only going to do it if it's cost effective. So that might take a while to prove that. Gotcha. What are some of the most prevalent side effects that you've heard from from your patients? Right. So one of the effects of GLP-1 is to slow intestinal function, mm -hmm. right? So remember, I call this the ileal break, mm. and the ileum being the terminal part of the intestine that secretes the GLP-1, and so we call it the ileal break. Well, that break causes the stomach to slow down. If the stomach slows down and you have eaten and the food's not going through, you can get nausea, you can get vomiting, you can especially get reflux. Some people with heartburn, this can be a real bad drug. Mm, okay. It can make it much worse. In fact, a lot of the anesthesiologists now are requiring that you be off the medication for at least two weeks before any anesthetic procedure because we're finding people with food in their stomach even though they didn't, you know, didn't eat the night before wow. uh, because the stomach slowing is – and you've, this has been on the news a lot and in magazines, they, they call it well, – 
the paralysis of the stomach. And there's some people worrying that this paralysis is permanent. I don't think it's permanent. I think that the medication has been used in people that are diabetic that may have already had permanent damage to their stomach from the diabetes, but I don't think the medication's permanent. But while you're on it, it could certainly cause considerable nausea and it could cause considerable reflux and heartburn. It has also been known to cause pancreatitis, which could be fairly serious. Okay. I haven't yet, and I've given out a lot of these prescriptions, I have yet to see pancreatitis in any of my patients, but it's certainly a risk. Um, we see a lot of constipation. Mm. There are some people that complain of diarrhea, interestingly, after the medications, but I've mainly seen constipation. Constipation could be a serious issue because, again, a, a couple of factors. You're slowing down intestinal function. You're also not eating as much, so right. uh, you're not eating as much fiber, and typically it also affects your uh, desire to drink. And so you're not drinking water and this mm. can be a bad kind of combination for development of constipation. Um, there is a risk of bowel obstructions because it's more of a pseudo obstruction, but your bowels just aren't working properly. Um, and so there have been people that have had abdominal pains and have had to stop the medications and things like that. There is a theoretical risk of thyroid cancer. Wow. Okay. Now, in rat studies, there was a development of a very odd thyroid cancer or just an uncommon uh, thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid cancer. And that would only be a risk if you had a family history of, of medullary thyroid cancer, which okay. is a pretty rare uh, familial type thyroid cancer. There was a study that suggested that there may be more thyroid cancers, even the normal thyroid cancers in people on GLP-1s. But... In that study, they were looking for this. They were ultrasounding thyroids and stuff, which we don't typically do. And they were probably finding some incidentally. And it's hard to say whether that's a correlation or causation. And it's probably more correlation than causation. Um, and it may not be related either. So I just don't think the studies are, are that good. And in fact, in a recent study when they were looking at it, there was more risk of thyroid cancer just from insulin than there was from GLP-1. Wow. Um, and so I... I think the thyroid cancer is probably a bit of a red herring. It's not a real risk, or if it is, it's a pretty low risk, and the risk-to-benefit ratio still favors the medications. And then there's, you know, some other things. You're, you're losing muscle mass, so your metabolism is going to slow. Mm -hmm. I mean, these kind of factors. When you lose weight, this can affect your gallbladder, and you could get gallbladder stones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that could be a risk. Hair loss from significant amount of weight, but that usually comes back as your weight stabilizes. Mm -hmm. But those are the main risks. Yeah. Seems, you know, with any with any drug, right, you're going to have that big list of potential side the effects that affects potential. everybody differently. And, you know, yeah. it's just you got to weigh your pros and cons about what you're willing to to give up to, to yeah. get something else. Yeah. And we don't, you know, we see some people complaining of nausea. We definitely see constipation, but that's mainly what we see. Gotcha. Gotcha. Is there anything more you can speak to about yeah, this decreasing other cravings, like maybe alcohol? Or yeah. I mean, they're, they're looking at it now for, uh -huh. um, gosh, people wanted to study it for um, depression. Mm. People want to study it for uh, addiction. I know several people that have had problems with addiction that are on this that think that it's definitely helping with their addictive cravings. Uh, that's not been formally studied yet, but it's certainly something that will probably be looked at in the future. Okay. Is there is there any concern that when you get on this drug, the patient will be like, okay, well, I'm on this now. I don't need to pay attention to my oh, of diet course. exercise. Yeah, this is a huge problem uh -huh. because you got to understand these trials that I am telling you about, the surmount trial and the step trials, these, these trials on these medications were done in very controlled settings. And it was the drug company's best interest to make sure that these patients are successful. So these patients had very good – teaching, right? Mm. They had dietary intervention. They had behavioral management. They had exercise counseling. Wow. Uh, and so these, these are people that are being followed very carefully mm. and that's how they're getting this number, this 19% or 22% if you're looking at Manjar. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you're getting that much weight loss. It's still better than the placebo group, but that was also getting that, but the placebo group did lose weight in these trials. Okay. So there is an effect to uh, lifestyle change. It's just not as good as lifestyle plus the medication. Right. But there were lifestyle changes with the medication. The problem I see now is that everybody is prescribing this medication. And there are, I mean, there's dermatologists, there's plastic surgeons, there's all kinds of people prescribing this medication. Even family practice doctors, 
but they're not giving the patient any lifestyle information. So they're like, take this medication and go on your way. Wow. And it's almost guaranteed to get you a pretty poor outcome. Uh Uh, You may get some weight loss, but it's not going to be these great numbers that we're seeing in these trials because these trials were a combination of lifestyle with the medication. Well, we all know how it is. Even when we're given proper instructions – Sometimes yeah. they're ignored. So they're you're, ignored. If you're not yeah. even getting the proper instructions, then you're just you're just out there floating. In you're the just wind. doing yeah. what you've always done. Yeah. You do okay. what you always done. You get what you always got. That really covers most of what I had. Uh, last question though for you: food, eating. You know, it's it's one of life's pleasures. It's one of my pleasures. Yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. I, I enjoy it. And uh, the patients who, who benefit from these drugs, um, you know, in addition to losing weight, they they might need them to avoid serious disease. But but realistically, um, you know, we talked about the, the dopamine effect and all that. Should they be ready for food to like not be as pleasurable for them anymore? That's a good question. And um, I I really haven't had anybody complain about that, but they do have a different relationship with food. Mm -hmm. Uh, They don't feel the same drive towards it. It just doesn't affect them. Uh, And so does it make food less enjoyable? Boy, you'd have to ask the patients that. That's not exactly the wording of the questioning I do with them. Uh, They seem very happy with whatever the situation they're in right now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's ultimately, that's what matters. Yeah. And that's the same with my weight loss surgery patients. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of the same thing. You just don't have the same uh, kind of relationship with the, with the food that you did before. Yeah. I mean, like anything else, right? I mean, it's it's a give and take on some area. So something's got to, uh, yeah, I, I don't, no one seems to miss it. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Davis, thank you so much uh, sure. for talking to us today. Uh, very informative and uh, uh, great to really dive into some of this th- this cutting edge new medicines. Yeah, it's exciting. So as we said, these are newer drugs and the way they're being used uh, for, for, for weight loss. And what was most interesting to me is all the studies have shown that as soon as people get off these medications, they immediately gain the weight back. So it's not like retraining your body and preparing you and easing you into a new status quo. It's just, yes, while you're on these drugs – You'll have less appetite and those sorts of things. But once you're off the drugs, all those urges and cravings come back. Yeah, I think it, it you know, he explained how they work, which kind of it helps you understand why that's the case. Um, but I think it also is it hinges on his point of, you know, losing weight isn't just taking these medications. You still have to do the other things like work on your diet and, you know, try to be more active and more mobile um, which I think, you know, is sort of the hallmark of of weight loss. It's complicated, mm-hmm. right? And like these drugs can be a really helpful tool, but they're not just the answer by themselves. Yeah, they're not a magic bullet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, which would be nice if they were. And I think they do way more than they have in the past. Like there's all these good things about them, but there's still, you know, it, there's still going to have to be some effort on everyone's part to um, to to make the really hard choices like, um, you know, go for that walk. Yeah. Um, after work, even though you're really tired and, you know, maybe well, not, it's hot outside. We, we talked about that. In our yeah. Podcast, yeah. But and then maybe not having like, you know, two slices of pie for dessert, just one. Those maybe not two hot dogs at a baseball game. Like I'm known to do. But yeah. another thing you mentioned in the, in these studies is, is all the participants were set up for success. Like the people running these studies were making sure that people were watching this, watching that. It wasn't just the pill and nothing else. It was more good. And that's his approach too, with his patients. Like, Hey, this is going to be a, a time where I can, I can help you learn how to better maintain your weight and, and, and not just rely on this pill, which nobody wants to be relying on medicine if you don't have to be. Yeah. And, you know, I think the idea that you may have to be on the medicine to keep that sustained weight loss, you know, I thought it was interesting that, you know, he likened it to taking a blood pressure medication or something that helps low, lower your cholesterol, that it's a tool in the toolbox to help you, stay as healthy as you can be, which, you know, I think is interesting, especially when you compare it to something like weight loss surgery, where, you know, if you don't want to have surgery, I think, you know, maybe taking a medication mm-hmm. long, longer term is the right call for you. Right. And, you know, for the surgery, because he does a lot of bariatric surgery, there's certain criteria you have to meet as a patient. And if you don't meet those criteria, well, this is another option for you. Yeah, I thought I thought it was really helpful to hear his take on it. You know, he prescribes these medications a lot. It was interesting when he mentioned that almost anyone can prescribe these now. And and it's being careful about um, having the right expectations going in. And I think that's why it's helpful to probably have these medications be prescribed by someone who understands weight loss really well, because, you know, Zach, you pointed out, yes, you know, some of these some of these medications help with 15 plus percent weight loss. But like you said, 
in a very controlled environment mm-hmm. where like what you're eating is being documented and how much your exercise is being documented. So having realistic expectations of like, that's, you know, best case scenario and they're, they're, you know, they're helpful either way, but, you know, making sure you're, you're working with your doctor to understand what else you need to be doing, what it means for you, having realistic expectations, not being upset when, you know, they're not working as fast as you want them to and stuff like that. Cause again, yeah, weight loss is just complicated and can be overwhelming and, I think that was one thing that I heard a lot from him as, as he was talking to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially with how, not necessarily the, how the drugs are marketed, but how you see it on social media, that it's being used as this aesthetic thing with people like celebrities, whereas it's really about using these medications and weight loss surgery is about your health. And so the distinction and maybe setting up, some of those expectations in that way comes down to, are you wanting to do it as a silver bullet for your, you know, to look good for a swimsuit season, or are you actually wanting to improve your health? Yeah, that's a really good point. Well, you know, I think people go on these drugs because they are unable to lose weight with through diet and exercise. So um, if you're not having side effects from them, if you end up having to take them long-term, that's probably not a bad thing, just as just as statins or other drugs you have to be on for life. Yeah. And we've heard other doctors on this podcast even mention that there's an underlying kind of almost like disease process involved with this. You know, people want to say it's as easy as willpower to lose weight. And like, I think most of the medical community is, is now saying like, no, this isn't a willpower problem. There's actual, you know, there's an actual condition here that needs to be treated like a medical condition rather than just like, hey, why can't you lose the weight? Right. That, um, that was one of his most like hot take statements, I think, when he's like, well, obviously diet and exercise doesn't work. You know? Yeah. And I understand well, what he's I mean, saying in that yeah, context yeah. It, alone for a lot of people. It just doesn't. No. Yeah. Look at the, in the context of like the American population. Yeah. I think that you could you can look at the, the population and say, yeah, that that is true. That mm-hmm. is the case. And, you know, starting to think of this as more as a medical condition and for medical conditions like cholesterol, high blood pressure you take the medications as long as you have the condition. So yeah. um, I think that also it kind of like gives some credence like to that sort of mentality that probably we all need to sort of shift that direction um, as we start thinking about weight loss and stuff like that. Yeah. So a lot of good information from Dr. Davis there and, and we're all still looking for that, that magic health pill we could just take once a day and, <laughs> and be our perfect weight and our perfect blood pressure and all that stuff. But it's not there yet. But it, again, as always, is the combination of all these things that we've been talking about and you know, one component, one tool in the toolbox. And uh, if it's right for you, please consult your doctors uh, about if you should explore this, if it's something you're interested in. So, yeah. And obviously, we record these interviews a little bit in advance of what we're doing now. And literally the day after we talked to Dr. Davis, uh, terzepatide, which is called Manjaro, used as a diabetes medication, was approved. Uh, and that's called Zepbound, now available as a weight loss medication called Zepbound. So there you go there. Medicine. Always coming out, always evolving, breaking news there as far as this podcast goes. So that's going to do it for this episode of On Health with Houston Methodist. Please share, like, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, stay tuned and stay healthy. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you again next Thursday at 6 p.m. For more information about the Chamber and our podcast, please visit us at ghwcc.org.